Hi, welcome to MBC Connect. I'm Madi Mihalcha, and my guest today is Ellen Zaid from the United States. Ellen is the founder of Cascadia Workshops and a certified uh, trainer with the Center for Nonviolent Communication. As a teenager, Ellen uh, decided he wanted to be part of the solution and uh, also realized that the change might come faster if he led by example. So he has studied uh, throughout his life uh, meditation, permaculture design, the integral theory, and many, many other things. I won't list them for you because we will take all the time for, for this interview. <laughs> but today, uh, we invited Alan to find out more about his journey with uh, nonviolent communication and also about our capacity to be agents of positive change. Alan, welcome. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Alan, one of the things I admire most about you is your ability to listen deeply. You create this mm. presence with, um, with the people who talk to you. And I really uh, admire your capacity to just be there as long as they want. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, uh, have you learned or perfected this skill uh, with the help of MVC or not? Or is it something that you were born with? Oh, I don't think I was born with it. I think, I think we're all born with the capacity to increase our skills or our abilities in many different areas. And mm -hmm, yeah, presence and empathic listening is one of them. And, and definitely nonviolent communication has helped me. Although I think I've grown more in that capacity since becoming a certified trainer. How did you discover nonviolent communication? What were you doing at that time you discovered it? It was, uh, it was interesting how it happened. I was working with young people, uh, teenagers, doing environmental education and action and leadership development and international cross-cultural exchange at a particular program. And the organization that had this program for me to work with young people had some budget for professional development. One of the groups I was working with had a lot of conflict. And so I went and took a conflict resolution workshop that was not NBC, but that's where I met a woman named Lucy Liu, and the year was 1994 or 95. And Lucy had just returned from an IIT, an international intensive training with Marshall. And she had a letter for her friends about her experience. And she asked me if I would join her to be part of the newly forming local community that would be inviting Marshall to the Seattle area starting then. So I attended uh, the first workshop with Marshall in Seattle in 1995. And at that point, he started coming to Seattle twice a year. And I had already been studying best practices. I wanted to find the most powerful tools, processes, methodologies for living in harmony within ourselves, with each other, and with the planet. And at that point, I had a lot of tools already, and I was not looking for another tool. I was not thinking I was going to get this deep into nonviolent communication. But there was something Marshall said, I think it was his second workshop. Uh, it just really clicked for me how if as human beings, we want to deal with global problems like climate change, species extinction, these very big issues, we need to really develop our skills for cooperation and collaboration if we want to create sustainable change on these big issues. So right there, I was hooked with NVC and, and uh, then started transforming my relationships in my life. And, and uh, yeah, that, it's been a journey since then. I get from what you're saying that you weren't really, let's say, hooked from the first workshop. No, I was interested in specific tools for working with this group of teenagers. Mm -hmm. I wasn't thinking that this would be a primary tool in my toolbox, which it, it has become. It, it's remarkable the, the power of it when people get to experience it, when people really put it into practice. It's quite remarkable. It's easy to intellectualize it or see it from the outside. And if you haven't experienced the power of it, it's, it's something that's easy to overlook or, um, yeah, just not think it's uh, as effective as it is. Yeah, I agree. 
When did you decide to start sharing MVC? After these workshops or you? Um, 19, 1998, I was a volunteer staff at a project in British Columbia called the Global Living Project. And it was a sustainable living boot camp research project and kind of a summer camp. And I was invited to teach uh, an intro to NVC to the staff of this program. And I hadn't taught NVC before. So I called my mentor at the time, Lucy Liu, and I asked her, do you think I'm ready to teach my first intro? And she said, yeah, I think you're ready. Just remember to teach it as a consciousness, not a technique. I think that that is the most important tip for a trainer, in my opinion. Uh, and I really enjoy uh, this um, this approach in every MVC trainer that I meet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what contributed to your decision to become a certified trainer? You know, I struggled with that for a long time. I struggled with the hierarchy that certification creates. I struggled with the labels. I struggled with the fact that it creates a certain separation sometimes to have a label. And so I needed to get very, very clear what needs of mine certification would meet. And uh, it was when I got clear on those needs that I, I really pursued it. But it took me three or four years to wrestle with this question. And the needs that I realized it would meet and has met so far is on the one hand, some places ask you about your credentials or uh, you know, having the certification would open doors for me in places where I would want the door open. And the other is that I knew that certified trainers had an email list, like a list serve where people ask each other questions or share resources. And I already had a lot of friends in the trainer community, but I, I, I really wanted to be a, a, a recognized member of that community for the resources, for the sharing, and, and just for the, the feeling of community and the experiences of community. So, so those were the two needs of mine that led me to decide to become certified. I see. And how did you, your life or your routine change when you started the certification process? If it did. Hmm. That's an interesting one because I was already teaching NVC. I had taught NVC for years before I decided to become certified. I called myself an independent trainer instead of a certified trainer. And the certification process changed many times. Uh, it's, it's changed three or four times since I became certified. So it, somebody beginning the process now is going through something different than what I went through. Um, I wouldn't say it necessarily changed a lot for me. It didn't change my routines or other things that the one thing that was interesting about the certification itself was that I did my final assessment with Lucy Lou and there were several other people there and th there were questions and, you know, about key di differentiations or other things in NBC. But then uh, instead of a role play, she brought in her husband who had a, a real issue with me. He had some anger that was real and that was unresolved. And, and I didn't know this was going to happen, but she brought him in and just put me on the spot. And uh, Peter and I had a conversation <laughs> as, as part of my final assessment. So that was interesting. Uh, but yeah, no, otherwise it, it didn't really change a, a, a lot of things. Mm -hmm. What helped you in, um, uh, in, internalizing the processes of nonviolent communication, nonviolent communication or the consciousness in general. Do, did you have some, I don't know, favorite exercise? Mm. That's, a, that's a great question. No, I didn't have a specific favorite exercise, but the analogy that, that sticks with me is uh, a type of cloth called denim. It's what they make blue jeans out of and that, that rich dark blue, the way that they make it is with a root called indigo and they boil the indigo root in, this, in a big vat of water. And then they take the cloth, which is off white or cream colored and they, they dip it in the blue dye and then they let it dry and it's very, very light blue. 
And then they, after it dries, they dip it again, and then it's slightly darker. And then it takes about six or more dips to get that rich blue color of you know, new blue jeans. So NVC is a little bit like that. Every time you go to a workshop, every time you attend something with a trainer, it's like getting another dip you know, in the, in the dye and it kind of sinks in a little bit more. So I think all of it, you know, practicing the self-empathy, practicing uh, self-expression, practicing empathic listening to somebody else. But Marshall said there were three ingredients to become fluent in nonviolent communication. And the first is interior clarity. For years, he called it spiritual clarity, but the word spiritual has multiple meanings that can be confusing. And when I pressed him on it, what he was talking about was interior clarity, clarity about what's moving me, my feelings and my needs, what's alive for me, what are my stories, what am I telling myself? That interior clarity is key. The second ingredient is some community of support. It could be a practice group. It could be um, uh, an empathy, honesty circle. It could be any number of things, but it's quite challenging if I'm in my uh, challenging, difficult home life and then I go to my uh, conflict-ridden workplace and then I come back to this difficult home life. It's hard sometimes to really grow with NVC, so that community of support is critical. And then the third ingredient Marshall mentioned is practice, practice, practice. So my, my primary relationship for many years was my primary practice group, my, my partner. But yeah, just everywhere and, and taking it out of the workshop scenario and practicing it in real life, like taking risks, you know, intervening or taking the risk of taking conversations deeper, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I love that analogy with the, the blue jeans and I will share, I will share it with your permission to of course. my friends <laughs> and yeah. I will credit you, of course. <laughs> Yeah, so this, this is from the perspective of what you shared uh, from the perspective of the um, practitioner. Uh, how about as an MVC trainer? I, from my point of view, like everything in life, uh, there are pros and cons of being an MVC trainer. Uh, what, do you love, what do you love most about what you're doing? And also what are the challenging moments for you in this process? Uh, challenging because of the role or just in general with NVC? In general, uh, for, uh, about the role, being an NVC trainer. Mm. Well, let me start with the hard parts. Um, the, for just people, people sometimes are interacting with a label instead of a human being. And this was part of the reason for the creation of NVC, Marshall was a student of Carl Rogers and Carl Rogers was interested in why authentic human connection is so healing and that sometimes the labels get in the way, but, way, but, way, but, but sometimes it, it, it has created distance, I think, between me and others. If they're projecting a teacher image or, a, or they, they, they just imagine that I'm a particular way. Um, so I think, that's, I think that's the biggest challenge. What I like the most in terms of working as a trainer are the transformations that I'm a part of and that I get to be part of. Um, I love working at the IITs, the International Intensive Trainings. They're a lot of fun. And one of the areas that I have found that I specialize in during the IITs are transformational role plays. Uh, I'll give you an example. I probably the most powerful role play, one of, a very, one of them, there are just so many, but there was a woman who came to one of the intensives who uh, several years previously had come home and found her husband's body hanging in the stairwell of their house and he had committed suicide. And so we did a role play in relation to her husband. And so I role played the husband who had committed suicide with NVC consciousness and gave her empathy for everything she went through. And after she got all the empathy, then she wanted to know, so why did you do it? And so I needed to dig really deep and find the parts of me that would do that. And, uh, and it was completely healing. It was, it was just the whole energy in the room. There were probably 20 or 25 observers 
and everybody was, I mean, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking about it. It was, it was quite remarkable. She reported that before that role play, there were certain yoga positions where she could not maintain her balance, but after the role play that she could. So there were actually physiological changes. So th those kinds of experiences, uh, I work a lot with couples. So later today, for example, I'm working with another couple. So being part of all these transformations, seeing light bulbs go off. My primary work is as a coach and mentor, and I use a lot of tools and I bring NVC to that. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so it's, it's the transformations and the light bulbs and seeing relationships transform. I just got a, I just got a message on Facebook messenger yesterday or the day before from someone who I did an exercise with at the intensive in Chile. And she wrote to me about how she took the learnings from that exercise and completely transformed this relationship with her sister. And they hadn't talked for maybe a decade. So they had been completely estranged. And based on this one exercise that we did in relation to her sister. And then in the end, she asked me for advice and I gave her what she asked for. And so I just got this huge gratitude just yesterday saying, love is flowing in my family. You know, it's just, those things are, are rewarding and beautiful. Yes. And, and really nourishing for a trainer. Uh, yeah. Like uh, you have uh, energy to go on with creating other uh, things and also going to other, other clients or participants and to sharing again and again the same thing because at some point from my point of view at least it can become daunting telling the same thing over and over again but like you say when you when you see the bulbs going off yeah that is really um rejuvenating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yes but, um, uh, i'm curious what is something that comes up more often than the rest when you speak with people who seek your support like um, um, a situation or a problem? What, one, one thing that comes up quite often that is not obvious to people until I point it out and then it seems obvious is that people come to me with conversations that are stuck and as they share about the situation, it becomes obvious that the reason it's stuck is because both people are needing empathy at the same time. So that happens a lot. I, I see that quite often is people are not hearing each other. They're both needing empathy at the same time. And so yeah, it's, um, it's yeah. evident. It's easy for me to see how to intervene, but for most people, it's not that obvious. Yeah. When, when you're in the, uh, in the situation, I, I can speak for myself at least, at least even uh, practicing MVC, sometimes I'm blind to that. Yeah, I, I get yeah, it so angry that uh, yes. I can't I can't see the other person needing empathy. It's yeah. everything about me, me, me. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Um, you know, go, going back to your question about things that are rewarding as a trainer, um, being invited into people's conflicts, the the level of expertise I've developed is very rewarding and fulfilling because. For example, I know almost nothing about auto mechanics, like probably zero or <laughs> close to zero. But it's that sense of you take your car to a master mechanic and they can just hear, oh, that one little sound, it's very subtle, but it sounds a little off and that's your blah, 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 because it's connected to the this that's loose, you know, and they just, they can just, so, so it's similar for me now when I get into people's relationship situations or conflict situations is I can see things really clearly that, that other people aren't seeing just because of that level of expertise. That's really rewarding just to have that confidence there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in the same note, what, what's the one thing you wish people would take and apply in their lives right away or when they leave your workshops or your sessions? embodied self-connection like self-empathy mm -hmm. yeah but not not just intellectualizing it like really feeling the feelings in your body really connecting with the needs uh, in your mind body structure 
Yeah, I would say self empathy. If if there were one thing, they would be that. Mm-hmm. Or or the insight that the energy with which we do things for each other is just as important as the action itself. The motivation behind doing things for each other is essential. It's critical. So those are, those are two, two possibilities there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I admit that uh, self empathy was the first process I started to applying MVC. Uh, And it was really, really helpful for me. Uh, um yeah and also um because uh our um our theme for this interview is uh change agency uh i guess that is the point because you told me something that we focus uh we tend to focus on symptoms uh not on the root causes and i guess that self-empathy might um might help uh tell me if i'm wrong uh to be aware of these root causes in in any problem in general it's not about the global at a global level or something but starting with ourselves Mm -hmm. yeah i think in some circumstances that's that's probably very true or it can open us up to moving in the direction of root causes Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, by itself, I don't know if I would give it that much power Oh, because, mm-hmm. because there, there are other things, there are other pieces, there are other things that are part of the picture. For example, the story we're telling ourselves, you know, our assumptions, our worldview. So if I, if I'm convinced that the earth is flat and I think mm-hmm. the CIA staged the moon landing and I think that they're you know, trying to deceive everybody about that, I might feel a lot of anger. I might feel a lot of disappointment. I might feel, um, you know, just irritation about it. So I can give myself empathy about that Mm -hmm. and connect with my feelings and my needs. And my need is for honesty and for clarity and for truthfulness. But my, but my, but my, my, but I might be giving myself empathy over a story that, that might not be true at all. And that's okay. That's fine. It helps me calm down. It helps me relax. It helps me if I'm developing needs vocabulary. And, and maybe that can help me be open to uh, updating my story. But that's why I would say, you know, self-empathy by itself, um, it, it's necessary, but not sufficient. Mm-hmm. I see your point now. Okay. Um, yeah. Would you... Would you expand more on what change agencies for you and also how do you differentiate <clears throat> from leadership? Well, it depends what you mean by leadership because there's so many, there, you know, there, there are dozens of books on leadership and different definitions of leadership. And the old, the old paradigm of leadership was, I'm the boss, I tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. Right. And that's, that would be a different style. That's that, for me, that's the old paradigm of leadership. Um, so, you know, some, some leaders are guides, some leaders are more like the travel agent, you know, here, okay. let's look at your destinations and then you go, but the travel agent doesn't go with you. You know, they're more like a guide in that way. Other mm-hmm. leaders are more, they lead through mentoring. Other leaders uh, have really good empathic listening. Or, or multiple of these tools and skills. So um, not, leader, not all leaders are transformational leaders or necessarily change agents. Some of them might be in a leadership position to maintain the status quo. So, so I just wanna clarify that, that, that I do think they're different. Although um, I think there are as many styles of leadership as there are human beings. So any organization that I'm a part of, I would like it to be what Marshall called a leaderful organization for everybody to be able to be a leader in their own way. Um, If you're going up the mountain in a group, uh, there are people who will lead in the front, but people can lead from the back as well to take care of those, somebody who twisted their ankle or to encourage people or just to be just aware of the group and holding the group. So you can lead from the back as well. Um, Change agency for me is 
Hmm. You know, personally, I, I see myself as participating in two revolutions that are happening on the planet. And I'm not only participating in them, I want to feed them, I want to expand them, and I want to accelerate them. And these two revolutions, one is the, conscious, the consciousness revolution, and the other one is the ecological sustainability revolution. And they, they have some overlap, but they're not exactly the same. And the consciousness revolution is basically, uh, in some ways, it's redefining these questions of uh, who are we as human beings? What is the good life? And what is our shared destiny on this little blue ball flying through space? So uh, who are we? Are we, are we merely consumers of stuff who, you know, are born, go to school, then uh, get a job, find a partner, buy a house, have babies. And what is the good life? Is, is it that the person with the most toys wins? I mean, what's the, all the, the consumer culture paints a picture of the good life that's actually quite unfulfilling. So the consciousness revolution is recognizing that it's about how we show up. It's about integrity. It's about care. It's about love. Uh, it's about, um, really seeing the interconnections and things. So um, one of the summaries of, of human consciousness growth is that human consciousness grows from egocentric to ethnocentric to sociocentric to world-centric. So mm -hmm. egocentric, just me, me, me. Ethnocentric, only other people like me. Sociocentric, only people of my nationality matter. To world-centric, so your compassionate embrace grows and can contain more. So who is, who is worthy of consideration and ethical treatment that, that circle grows and grows and, and can include other species beyond humans. So that's the consciousness revolution and the ecological sustainability revolution simply recognizes that economy is a subset of ecology. Mm-hmm. Our economy is dependent on natural systems for resources and to uh, absorb pollution. And, and so uh, we can't grow the economy bigger than the ecology. And if we try, we're killing ourselves. So having an economic system that's based on infinite growth mm -hmm. is like flying an airplane using only the altimeter. Higher is better. And that's just not true. So, uh, Famous environmental author Edward Abbey said that growth for the sake of growth is the ideology of the cancer cell. When you look at when you, when you look at Ken Wilber's work and you look at the four quadrants and and I won't go deeply into it, but just simply recognizing that things have interiors and things have exteriors. Mm -hmm. So you can measure my you can me measure my brain waves. We can connect an electroencephalogram and measure you know, my alpha waves, my beta waves, and my theta and delta waves. But then there's the interiors of images I might have, or my intentions, or my feelings, or my desires. Looking at my brain waves on an electroencephalogram does not tell you that I'm fantasizing about what I'm going to eat for lunch. It, you know, so so uh, these things are not reducible to each other. We can't reduce... Uh, interior experiences to atoms and brain waves and, and vice versa. Both might be true, but we do this all the time. So you take something like depression and if somebody's uh, reducing everything to the exteriors, then they say, well, the reason you have depression is because you need, you're missing some neurotransmitters uh, between your neurons. So take this pill, you need more serotonin or more dopamine or, um, and that might be true. Or, if somebody is only preferencing the interiors, they'll say the reason that you have depression is because you lack more meaning and purpose in your life. And that might also be true. And they both can be true. So um, change agency involves working within myself, working on my specific behaviors, uh, improving the, the we uh, interpersonal space that can't be weighed or measured. 
things like trust and connection and um, goodwill. And then also working on systems and structures. It's not enough to change individual behaviors. We really need to change systems and structures uh, because they... they have question actually in, because in our yeah. discussion before this uh, interview you told me that agents of change nourish and fortify i think this these were uh, your words um nourish and fortify themselves in five areas would you expand on uh what areas and why yeah. these areas and also how if you can tell us okay um you know i've i've wanted to work with people who have this dual commitment. That's who I reach out to. What I, what I call positive change agents, there's not a demographic, but there are two psychographics. And these are two values or two commitments that these people have. One of these commitments is to their own personal growth and development. And the other commitment is to making a difference, leaving the world a better place than they found it. And some people are working on themselves a lot. They're working on their personal development but being of service or making a difference is not yet on their radar, so to speak. They're not, uh, that's not their commitment yet. Uh, so I'm not talking to them. And then there are people who want to make a difference, but they're, they're at the peak of human evolution, thank you very much, and they don't have anything more to learn. So I'm not interested in them either. But if somebody has both these commitments, that's important to me. And so I call these people positive change agents. And I'm, I'm, I'm part of that group also. I'm, I'm a member in, in, the, in my own, you know, audience. And as I was pondering and contemplating the needs of change agents and also what would help change agents be more powerful, as I thought this through, I came up with these five areas and they are uh, mindsets. Some people think of them as states or moods or, um, in, in some ways, it's also part of our worldview. So mindsets. Um, the next one is tools. And uh, tools in the sense of uh, processes, methodologies. Um, and the New Age movement, starting from the late 60s and throughout the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, the New Age movement has given us hundreds of wonderful tools and thousands of not so great tools, things that aren't very effective. And so discernment is, is key. And that was part of the path that I started in my late teens is I wanted to find what are the, the most powerful or highest caliber, excuse the analogy, uh, what are the highest caliber tools, processes, methodologies uh, for creating positive change. So, um, so really great tools are important. So mindsets, tools, Having, having a tool is different than being skillful with that tool. So the third one is skills, because we, we don't just want the tools, we want to be skillful with them. If I've never seen a hammer, and you give me a hammer, and then I bend the first three nails that I try the hammer on, I can conclude that hammers don't work. And then I give you your hammer back and say, this thing doesn't work. I'll go back to a rock. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but it's, it's the lack of skillfulness in, you know, and you might say to me, Alan, no, you can't hit it like this. You have to hit it flat so that it really pushes the nail in. You know, you can coach me on being more skillful with it. So mindsets, tools, skills, resources, and the last one is community. So resources are often financial resources. There are many really positive projects that are not thriving because societally we direct money to um, you know, sports athletes and other kinds of celebrities. Uh, you know, if a, if a Martian anthropologist came to planet earth, they would think that professional basketball players are doing the most important work on the planet because look at the amount of resources we direct toward them. Uh, so financial resources, but it could be informational resources. It could be people resources. It could be, you know, making a connection with someone. It could be different kinds of resources, including interior resources, uh, going back to mindsets, uh, and then community because we don't work in isolation. We can't work in isolation and it's damaging to try and to believe that we can work in isolation. The humans were not designed that way. And we have some very dangerous myths in our culture 
and I don't know if this is Western culture in general or if it's the United States in particular, but there's this myth of I need to go it alone, like the rugged individual. So I just work on my own problems and I don't reach out to others. And I see this extend to couples where a couple says, oh, we should be able to figure out all our own issues. We don't need help or support. And I've seen it extend to families where they isolate and they say, oh, we don't air our dirty laundry in public and they try to work on everything just themselves and it doesn't work. So for me, individuals, couples, and families exist in the context of community. Now there's something interesting in the evolution of community because in pre-modern times, we had the extended family. You had the aunties, the uncles, the grandmas, the grandpas, the cousins, you had you know, all these people to take care of you as a child or to bother you. Um, or whatever, but because you were stuck with the people you were born with, you didn't really get to, you know, that that's, you were born in this village with this family and that was your life. Um, and then modern times came and as society has become increasingly urbanized, then we've lost the extended family with few exceptions, but mostly we have. And now it's this nuclear family model. And my colleague Kelly Bryson calls it the nuclear disaster the nuclear family disaster because of the isolation of it. And now there's this opportunity as we move beyond modernity into postmodern and post postmodern times where you see people starting to create chosen family. You see people starting to recreate community by choosing to live with people that they resonate with and starting to discuss, you know, what is our shared intentionality? And I think, this, this movement of intentional communities that has been happening for several decades now um, is not going to slow down anytime soon. It is, from my perspective, part of the evolutionary edge of humans is how, to, how do we live together cooperatively in a way that works for everybody. And I think NVC is critical for that. But, you know, everything from I'm very triggered and before I lash out, I need to pick up my phone and you know, get on the phone with my empathy buddy. So I, I try to encourage everybody to have a minimum of between three and 10 people they can call at a moment's notice. The, one of the last times I had a crisis happen, I called the first person on my list, they had no answer. So then I called the second person on my list, bad timing. I called the third person on my list. They were able to spend time with me, you know, and then the first person called me back and like that. So so we, we really need community to be able to move forward and not, not codependent, but, uh, but, de but definitely interdependent. Okay. What so mind hear? mindsets, tools, yeah. skills, resources, and community. So these are the five areas that I think if positive change agents really uh, explore these five areas and make themselves more robust in these five areas, they, they will do great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for, for listing them again. Uh, I'm wondering yeah. what major challenges may someone face when they decide to become an agent of positive change in their family, with their friends, in, the, in their work environment, and also how to handle them? Yeah, um, well, one of the changes is, one of the, one of the experiences is isolation. Because we think, oh no, am I the only person who thinks this way in my family? Or am I the only person who thinks this way in my school or in my city? And we, we need to find other people. That's that sense of community. For empathy and for encouragement and for brainstorming, you know, for all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges is isolation. One of the challenges is burnout. Trying so hard, trying so hard, trying so hard and not seeing change happen and not getting enough empathy. So if I'm not getting empathy, and if I'm not also counterbalancing with celebration and gratitude. So that, that whole spectrum of mourning and celebration, we also need community for that. But if I'm, not, if I'm not processing my grief, then um, I'll start to experience heaviness in myself and I can become cynical and depressed and, uh, so, so, so there's a challenge around processing grief. That's mm -hmm. huge for change agents because we, 
we live in, in really tough times. I mean, just looking at photos from Syria is completely heartbreaking. Yeah. So, so we need to, we need to continue to take care of ourselves and, and process our grief and, and with each other. But you know, there's, there's something here. Have you heard of uh, a phenomenon called a Harajuku moment? Um, no. Yeah. It's it, you can look it up. It has its own Wikipedia page even, uh, but it's H A R A J U K U Harajuku, just like it sounds. And I think it's a Japanese word, but it, um, a Harajuku moment is an epiphany like experience where a nice to have becomes a must have. So for example, I decide I'm not doing enough exercise and I think I should exercise more. And I really want to exercise more and I, I want to get more exercise. And every day I tell myself I should exercise more, but I don't do it. Or maybe I do a little bit or I try one day and then, uh, and then, you know, a couple months later, maybe I try again. Uh, a Harajuku moment, when I have this moment that's like an epiphany where this nice to have thing becomes a must have, now I don't need to tell myself that I should exercise. I just do it. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't, you know, think, oh, I should go in my calendar and schedule a time. No, I just, I, I do whatever needs to be done for this to happen, whether it's exercising more or changing my diet or, um, whatever, whatever changes people need to make in their lives. Sometimes we have this, we're just on fire and things won't stop us. So if somebody's lucky enough to experience a Harajuku moment, then these obstacles are speed bumps. They don't, they won't stop you because you have a, a, a vision or something that's pulling you that's energizing you. Uh, for me, it's been both something I was moving toward and something I was moving away from, but uh, that was in the early years. Now it's mostly toward. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, maintaining, um, just maintaining contact with the vision, you know, that's another challenge that I think change, change agents face. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I also, um, before my last two, two questions, uh, I just want to thank you for the clarity on this uh, on this subject because uh, it was something interesting for, for for me at least, and I also believe in this power of becoming agents and becoming aware that we come we we can become um, on. A small level, let's say small, depending on on everyone, but each of us can do something um, for themselves, for for their community. Like you said, uh, we will grow, yes, uh, and we yes. will accept more people around us, and we will give yeah. to more. Uh, I did. So- I did think. I did think of one other challenge that's quite big for change yeah. agents, please, please. which is which is uh, financial sustainability, mm-hmm. and. And it's connected with uh, how do we interact with this economic system Mm -hmm. that seems to be designed so that we don't see the impacts of the economic system. When I buy a thing at the store, the, 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 the labeling doesn't tell me what river got polluted, you know, how much, you know, toxic chemicals was put into the air. I mean, it doesn't, the, the, the actual impact, of our consumer culture and you know, most positive change agents want to uh, sustain themselves financially in a way that's also contributing. And that's sometimes that's, that's tricky. Sometimes that's hard to find, or we turn money into the enemy and we start to think money is bad. Money is evil. Um, so the whole question around economics is a huge challenge. Yeah. I totally agree. I'll stop there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my um before my last question i please tell us what are you doing at the moment any plans in progress and also where can people find you so uh i'm doing a lot of things at the moment i'm i'm writing several books i'll be teaching at uh, an international intensive training in houston in october i'm mm-hmm teaching courses online. I'm launching a new program for uh, social entrepreneurs, social entrepreneur roadmap in June. This mm-hmm. course will, will start and that's specifically for change agents who w- want to run their own business. 
and, and want to learn how to be entrepreneurs, especially leveraging the internet. But the biggest thing I'm doing, Maddie, is I'm synthesizing, I'm integrating all my learnings from the last 30 years because I started my research when I was 16 or 17. So I, I turned 47 this year. And uh, it's a personal, professional, and leadership development program that looks at eight areas that in each of these areas is focused on a core competency mm -hmm. and some best practices. Mm -hmm. And the organizing principle, these eight areas are organized around the compass or what they call the compass rows, north, south, east, west, and the corners. And so each of these points of the compass, for example, in the east is interpersonal relationships. You're going to be a more powerful change agent if you have functional, effective, interpersonal relationships. And one of the best practices, probably the best one I found in that, for that core competency is nonviolent communication. Yeah. So that's one area and there's seven others. And so I'm putting together this program uh, that's a personal professional leadership development program. That's, yeah, and that's in my current plans. Of this, uh, of this video, we will put the links. So for people who are oh, watching, yeah. we'll uh, we'll have the links to to your uh, website as well, CascadiaWorkshops.com. Yeah, and everything uh, that uh, that you talked about. I'd like okay. to give you a couple a couple other links if that's okay. Yeah, after after uh, yes, we we will. Oh, oh okay, perfect, mm -hmm. perfect. Yeah, sure. Uh, the last question because uh, I know you have to go. You have other appointment after this. I do, I do have another call after this. Yes, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. So what is the vision you hold for the world and the role that MVC could play in it? So when I think about where we live and I look out into space, you know, humans, we're looking for other habitable planets, but it's hard to comprehend what a light year is. The distance that light travels in one year, that is so far. The closest habitable planet is, is way farther than a light year. So right now there is no planet B. Mm -hmm. And when I, when I think about you know, space and I look out there, we're in the middle of a desert. So our, our planet is a little oasis. Mm -hmm. It's a garden planet. And I think that we can uh, re-green our planet and, and our planet can provide enough for humans and other species to have a very fulfilling life. So my vision for the planet is uh, that we're able to reverse course in terms of the destruction of ecosystems and indigenous peoples and that we can learn to see humanity as one family. And we can start to speak to each other on that basis and start to heal and mend some of the differences. There's a lot of healing that needs to happen. There's a lot of grief work that needs to happen. And, uh, and I think once humanity is, is able to resolve conflicts without violence and, and we've regreened the planet, I think new vistas, new possibilities are going to open up for what's possible. And I have a feeling that some of that has to do with love and joy, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah i love i love your vision alan thank you so much for being here with us and answering our question and also thank you for being an agent of change and uh, bringing your gifts into the world alan thank you maddie very very grateful to have been here and uh let's talk again whenever you want yeah for sure okay yeah, thank you guys for watching. If you like this video, uh, gives us a thumbs up, share it to share it with your friends, and also be sure to subscribe to our channel. Check the description of this video for the links and details about what Ellen talked. And see you next time. Bye.